God of creation There at the start before the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the planets form. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you made. Every burning star, signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain. Syllable empty your voice. But once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath. Evolving in pursuit of what you say. If it all reveals your nature, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you say. Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you, so will I. So will I, so will I. If the stars are made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar in greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. Some of all my praises still fall shy. And we'll sing again a hundred billion times. The God of salvation. Chase down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created, the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Well, you lost your life so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've done. Every part, design, and a work of art called love. If you gladly choose surrender, so will I. 
I can see it in your heart, it built in different ways. Every precious one, a child you died to save. If you gave your life to love them so alive, like you would again a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Today we're continuing in our series in the book of James, and I invite you to look in your program. You're going to find a little outline there for you. Opportunity to fill in some blanks and follow along as we go through this this book, but also this uh, particular text that we're going to be looking at today. You know, in the New Testament... The New Testament Christian church faced a lot of persecution. In fact, a gathering like this could find themselves in great conflict. Conflict within their community. Oh, you're a Christian? I'm no, no business with you. And, or military-wise, gathering together. There could have been real issues. Throughout our world today, there are still people who gather in silence, gather uh, in guarded areas to where they're not going to face the difficulties of perhaps being even arrested, to have a Bible in some areas of the country is against the law. We're so grateful to be able to live in the country in which we are. We can gather so freely and worship our God so openly and have His Word so readily available whenever we want to seek access to it. But that was James' concern, yes, about the people facing persecution that was bound to come their way. But he was really, in this book of the Bible, he was more concerned about the genuineness of their faith. That it was something that was real. That it was something that was lived out in your life. Because of Christ, this is now who I am. Because of Christ, I have become a new creation in Him. And this is how I live out my life. And so I invite you to open your Bibles to James chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 through 18. And uh, get to the Word. The Word is central here at New Life. And so not just here on Sunday mornings, but throughout the week. And today's message is going to demonstrate how important that is. To have God's Word in us so that it flows out of us. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. And we're looking at the encouragement app. To go along with this, we're looking at six things that God encourages us through this book of James to put into action and in our lives on a regular basis. And one of them is encouragement. Do you know statistically that you will receive six complaints or criticisms for every one word of encouragement? Isn't that amazing? I mean, when you think about that, hopefully that's not true here at New Life. I think it's the opposite. Here at New Life, you should be receiving six compliments for every one complaint, right? As New Life people, as children of the King of Kings, we should be bringing life into people's lives and their walk. You know, many of you have taken extra time to encourage me as your pastor. As I shared a few weeks ago, going through a very rough week, many of you have taken time to text me, to email me, to stop me in the store, to say, hey, I'm praying for you. I want to say thank you, because I know I have gotten over six compliments and encouragements for every one criticism. Let's open our Bibles to James chapter 3. I've asked Stephanie Patterson to come and read God's Word for us. So with our tradition here is to stand when God's Word is being read. Stephanie, thank you so much. You want to go right on up there and have a spot there for your Bible. As we read chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. All right. Taming the tongue. Not many of you should presume to be teachers. My brothers, because you know what, that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships, for an example. Although we are so, they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is, small, is a small part of the human body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set 
on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and it itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it curse men who have been made in God's likeliness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or grapefruit bear figs? Neither can be neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Two kinds of wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter evil and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. For you have envy and selfish ambition. There you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Stephanie. Could you put the mic back there for me? Great. Thank you. Wow, here we go, huh? Controlling the uncontrollable. Some would say, wow, you sure picked a great topic for Mother's Day, right? But it's so easy to get caught up in the negative of this passage, and we'll get there. We're going to talk about that, but don't miss the blessing of this passage as well. Controlling the uncontrollable. Proverbs says the tongue can bring death or life. And so it's a choice that we make. And then the challenge is, is how are we able and empowered to make the positive choices? You know, we've heard about this from James before about controlling the tongue. Clear back in chapter 1, he says, If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Right? I mean, it's, 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 he's just so in your face and so plain, and it makes us take a, a look and, and to reflect. I know for myself, just putting this message together, I was like, oh my goodness, here we go, you know? Uh, how am I acting? How, what am I speaking? What are the words that I am saying? And it's so easy to fall into that criticism role, right? Like, oh, I wish this was different, or I wish this person would act differently, or I, I wish I didn't have to face this right now. It was just so easy to have that criticism or complaints come out of my mouth. And it's a part of that is the battle within us because we're broken. We're, we're, we have a sinful nature, and that's what James is talking about to us here, that, that we do have this sinful nature that rises up, and it's a constant battle. Before we get into the whole thing about the tongue, these first couple of verses, James encourages us to take note. And he talks about being teachers, and, and his whole first two verses are kind of introductory in nature, but I think he identifies three particular things we should be aware of. And the first one is caution. Caution. And he, he's saying for those who would choose to teach. And so it's easy to go. That's talking about you, Pastor Gary. It's easy to go there. Or, or any other pastor or any other person who's teaching a Sunday school class or a small group Bible study or whatever, right? It's, it's easy to do. But I would say it also speaks to all of us. Because whenever God uses us to bring out his word, we need to be cautious. Because taking up that teaching opportunity, the danger is not in what we say as so much as what our motive is behind it. And so as we walk with God's word as followers of Jesus Christ, isn't it easy to stand up and wag this in somebody's face with the wrong motive? Instead of bringing life, like Jesus said, or the Proverbs says, we oftentimes can bring death. 
Sometimes people in our community know more against what we're against than what we're for. And so they know more about the death part of what we say as Christ followers than the life-giving part that Jesus came to remind us about. And so James is saying here, don't forget the tremendous responsibility that you have and your tongue in using and speaking God's truth. And I got to tell you, it's with fear and trembling as your pastor. I stand here every week. The opportunity I'm so gracious for to share God's word with you as fellow Christ followers, but to speak into your lives. It takes great discernment on my part to not just let my mouth fly. Because I always seem to find some way of having the unintentional joke of the day. You know, things slip out and I have to guard that. But the, the, the key here that James is talking about, caution, is making sure you're doing it for the right reason. And the second thing I think he brings is realism. He really brings a realism that, that we all make mistakes. Do you see that in there? Where he says, we all stumble, right? Not one of us has said everything perfect this week. We've all made mistakes. We've all spoken out of hurt habits or hang-ups. We've said things that have injured ourselves as well as those around us. And James says that's, that's kind of how it is, that that's being real. There's no one here who's perfect. In fact, we're here gathered because the only one who was ever perfect in this life was Jesus Christ. Amen? And he's the one who sets the example. And here's the goal. God has a desire for to conform you, to change you, to speak into your life by his power of his Holy Spirit, to be more like Jesus. Not to be religious, but to go about bringing life and speaking truth in a way that's graceful like Christ did. Speaking beyond the issues into the life a way that was effective in people's lives. And then James also in these two verses gives us a sense of hope. A sense of hope, something that everybody's looking for. He says, you want spiritual maturity in your life? Concentrate on what's coming out of your mouth. That's hopeful. And it's hopeful because he doesn't say it's impossible. Do you see that? He says it's impossible for people to control their mouth. But it's not impossible for God. And that's why he goes on then into this whole next section and gives us six pictures of the tongue and how small it is, but yet how powerful it is. The first thing he says is the power to direct. Your tongue has the power to direct. Now, one could say, you know what? If it's such difficulty and it's so hard, I'm not going to say anything. Right? To choose a vow of silence. Therefore, I won't make a mistake. If I just choose not to speak, that's one method, right? Because it comes from an evil heart. Because it's so easily to slip into the, the complaint section. But that's not what James is saying here, that we should take that road. Some of you are wishing people in your life would choose to be silent. <laughs> But James is saying, no, there's a way, there's a hope, there's a power to direct. And he gives us these two examples. And the first is the bit in the horse's mouth, right? Isn't it amazing? You watch, like, if you go to the rodeo or you go to, with uh, the 4-H teams or whatever, and you see these young people working with animals, and particularly with horses. You'll see this two, 3,000-pound horse being directed by a 70-pound kid, right? Just with the bridle over the tongue of the horse's mouth. I know there's a, a lot more going on, as Joanna Stevenson reminded me. A lot is in the legs, too. But yet we power and control and direct an animal, a horse particularly, just by pulling on the reins. And James is saying this is the, the comparison. This little muscle then your body has a huge impact and you're able to direct it. You're able to guide it. It can make or break you, right? It can open doors for the future or it can close doors for you. It can encourage other people. It can hurt other people. It's wide open and it can determine the direction of your life. It's like a bit in the mouth of a horse, James says. And then he talks about the rudder. The rudder on a ship, it's massive piece of boat, right? A ship, and it's directed by something so tiny as a rudder. And James is saying the same as with our mouth. 
You know, we really do have that old nature that we battle with, don't we? And yet God is saying there's a way to get over that. I mean, we find ourselves saying the things that we shouldn't say. We've got to get control of our tongue. In fact, James Wood encourages us, just as the horse needs a guide and the rudder needs a pilot, so our tongues need the Lord to help control them. Now, James spends a lot of time on the negative side. And so we're going to sit in this for a moment. So come along with me and dig up the words where James is using about the tongue and its power to destroy. You notice how he says there in verse 5, no, no one can tame the tongue. James is uncensored. He gives it to us straight up, bears the truth with all its force. Don't, I mean, don't you affirm that statement? No one can tame the tongue. The tongue, you hear, hear how harsh his words are. The tongue can be, can be restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Now you may sit here and say, you know, God has given me victory. And I used to really peg people in so many criticisms. I was that six to one mouth. But by God's grace, he's transformed it. And he's changed it. But I can tell you this. You probably experience it every day. Criticism. Negativity. Words that wound. And if you don't, your kids do. At school. In their neighborhood. Even playing with a friend. Because see, words of negativity that destroy can impact your life and set your life direction for your whole life. Words like, you're always so clumsy, right? You adapt that. You adopt it. It becomes your identity. Well, I'm the clumsy one, right? Why are you so stupid? Don't it make sense to you? Can't, don't you have any common sense, right? It impacts, well, I'm the dumb one. That's why I don't do well at school. You're always so mean, Right? So now you become the, you're a bully. Now you become the bully. You're known at school as the bully. That's what you do. That's who you are. See, words have power to destroy and set your life direction. You'll never amount to anything. You're not as good as your brother. Your sister always excels so much better than you. Right? See, the damage, the destroy, the words that flow so easily. James says it's like a fire. It's like a fire in a person's life. And we're here in Idaho, we know about range fires, right? A little spark. I was just meant to weld the gate. That's all I meant to do. 3,000 acres later, right? Planes had to come in and shut the fire down. I mean, it's so, it happens so easy. And James gives us this great visualization. And that's a lot like gossip as well. The painful thing about gossip is that not only does it hurt people, but so often it can get the wrong information out about someone. People can say, did you hear about such and such? Yeah, I heard. I heard this. And it may not be accurate, but you filled in the blanks with what you think happened. And all of a sudden, a mistruth, an untruth a false testimony is being said about someone. And with our internet access today, and here in small town, it can happen like that. Phones are going off, and notifications are being hit, and all of a sudden, this person or that person, yeah, it's destructive. Bonnie Miller at the Chicago Times writes these words about gossip. She says, it's always hurtful, but once limited to note passing, phone calls, and writings on bathrooms and walls is more pervasive and vicious as ever, thanks to the Internet. A senior in high school said that as an eighth grader, she was the subject of an online rumor that she had slept with a football team. She said, I think it was started by the ex-girlfriend of a boy on the team. It didn't matter where it came from. People wanted to believe it. There was no way to refute it. I wanted to kill myself. That's the pain of words to destroy, right? And that's what James is talking about here. The devastation that can come 
It's like a fire. But you see, there's the other side of that fire. There's a purifying fire. Fire that comes from God. And we look back to the day of Pentecost and we see that fire. That fire that is a healing. When the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, there were tongues of fire from heaven to enable Christians to witness. There is a fire that is healthy, not like the fire that James is talking about. And he goes on and he talks about how not only like fire, but it's also dangerous like a a wild animal. It's restless and it can't be ruled. It seeks its prey and then prounces and kills. It's full of deadly poison. These are hard, hard words. It must be tamed. And Augustine writes this. When the tongue is tame, we admit That it was done by the mercy of God, by the assistance of God, and by the grace of God. Amen? It's that spirit working in us that enables us to move from power to destroy, which is our natural sinful nature, to the power and the ability to use our tongues to bring delight into the life of each other and with people. Our tongues, we bless God our Father. It's like a fountain. James says our words can be like a fountain of refreshment. Of, I think of cool water fountains. Don't you love them in your yard or, or as you go and go about and you see these, these fresh water fountains and they just bring life, don't they? The sound of them is refreshing. The look of them is appealing to your eyes. The, the sense of coolness in the heat of a day. We even symbolize it in baptism. The baptismal fountain. Right? That refreshes and brings life and reminds us of a God who loves us in spite of our damaged selves and our tendency toward evil. He talks about how the tongue is also delightful because it's like a tree. You know, in the Bible lands, we think about even here, uh, trees were very important to the economy. They would hold the dirt in place and keep things from shifting around. They provided beauty and shade In the heat of the summer months. One of the things that's important to remember as a tree is its root system. How it sustains itself. You know, a storm like we had that loosens up the soil and makes it soft. And then we get our great spring winds that come through. Any of y'all lose a tree this year? Or have branches bust off? So important that the the root system of a tree is healthy. That it can uh, tolerate those winds. In fact, some say that that's what strengthens a tree, is the wind. You know, I like to do gardening. I don't know if you do indoor seeds, but one of the reasons you harden off your seeds outside after they've produced inside and grown is so that they can harden up, that they can toughen up, so that they can be, it's even called hardened off. And some of it is wind. Wind causes the the stems of those plants, those fresh young seedlings, to toughen up so they can weather the regular weather outside. If you just put them out there, like I did this year, a couple of them, they'll wither and die. They can't tolerate it. They can't withstand it. And so that's going to be the theme of our next message series about being deeply rooted in God's unfailing love. This is going to be our summer series as we dig into the lives of Samuel and David in the Old Testament. And I'm adding to it some psalms to go along with it so that we can be deeply rooted in God's amazing love that he has for us and withstand the storms and the trials and the difficulties of life as examples of Samuel and David. Wow. Psalms 92, and I'm going to challenge us to memorize this verse. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. What a great passage to have in your repertoire for the Holy Spirit to take out in those difficult times. James issues a warning, though about with the power to delight and the idea of the fountain and the tree. And he says it's straightforward. A fountain can't give two kinds of water. I watched a PBS special about the contamination of water in Idaho, particularly in some of the lakes and some of the streams. Where was it that, I forget, in this documentary they showed where all those elk drank of a poison stream and all died 
I think there, I forget how many are you. How many were there? There was a bunch of them. They just all died because they drank of a poison stream or poison water. And then James remind us a, t- a tree can't bear two different kinds of fruit, right? It produces what it is planted and designed to do. And so we need to ask God for help. That's, that's the end of this whole thing, that our spiritual roots dig deep into his word. How is God's word going to come out of your life if you're not reading it? How, how is God going to use his word to bring life to others through you if you never open the book or get the app out? You have to put a schedule for yourself to dig deeper into the Word. And some of you are saying, you know, right now you're saying, you know what, that's right. I need to do that better. Well, let me encourage you to start with the Psalms. Just start reading through the Psalms. And you're gonna, God's going to give you such verbiage and life. You Choose a translation that's helpful for you. I like the message. It's so fresh. It's the, the verbiage it uses in the Psalms is great. How about Proverbs? If you can't read a lot, just read Proverbs. You read one or two of those and you're good <laughs> for a couple of days because they're very insightful of wisdom. And that's what James talks about. Fill your life with wisdom that comes from God. And the way that he reveals it to us is through his word. There's your challenge for the day. God's unfailing love. A way to walk hand in hand, even when we don't see eye to eye. Here at New Life, we try and we strive through God's help to be civil, compassionate, and Christ-honoring. We want to speak words of encouragement. This is a place where words of encouragement are being spoken regularly. And I love you, New Life, for that. You're always looking for opportunity of how you can speak into the lives of kids here. That's why there's so many of them here. And I think about what's happening in children and worship right now. That's not a babysitting service so that you can be here with your family or be here so that you can hear God's word. There are men and women who go out of this space to speak of God's unconditional love for these littles that God has entrusted to us. And as a church, we've committed ourselves to come alongside you as parents And to speak words of life and encouragement that even though they stumble, even though they fall, even though their little angry selves show up, right? I want, right? God just smiles and loves on them. And we're oftentimes that example. You know, here at New Life, I would like to say we could really grab a hold of this. It's in your outlines. We're not going to gossip. We're not going to engage in this deadly poison that can destroy lives, family, and people. We're not going to spread those stories. We're not going to hear them or pass them on. We're going to put a stop to them, and we're going to share words of life. I hope we can grab a hold of that and ask God to help you to ask the questions. When you did you hear about? To ask the question: Is this gossip? Is this potentially hurtful? If I'm not part of the solution, maybe I shouldn't be engaged in talking about it. It's a hard world out there. A lot of stuff, a lot of anguish, a lot of anxiety, a lot of pain in our culture. And it's all around us. But let's covenant together. Meaning let's promise with each other that this is a a space where we're going to speak words of life. And that's your application for today, the encouragement app. Remember what I said in the beginning? Six criticisms or complaints for every one positive or word of encouragement. What kind of world are we creating? We're responsible. What kind of generation are we raising? We're responsible. What kind of work culture are we creating? School's ending, but what kind of school culture are we creating? We're we're responsible. What kind of marriages are we modeling? What kind of relationships with our friends or even our family? We can change it. We can change the world by the way in which we live, by the words that we choose and the lives that get affected and the lives that get changed. 
This past week, I, I was encouraged by a teacher. They, they sent me a picture of one of their students. They did a, a, a display or they did a, a workbook and they said, they asked the question, what's your favorite place? Now, you can imagine some kids are probably, what's my favorite place? I love going to the river. Or I love going to Grandma's house. I love going to Disneyland. Their favorite place, right? And I blocked out the name, but one of the students said this, New Life, on Wednesday. And they wrote a little poem, and it says this, La La Lay Tick Tock, Pastor Friends Bible. Singing and dancing this Wednesday, today, happy and excited. Can you imagine that? I looked at that and I was just blessed and I, I'm bringing it forward to you that you would be blessed as a church. Susan, you worked hard this year. You know, you're going through cancer, treatment, and God's given you a victory we went from every Wednesday night of 120, 130 kids average to once a month with an average of 30, 40. We were disappointed. We wanted all those 120, 30. But you know what? I'm sure glad this one was there. Right? I'm sure thankful as a church that you support us having a staff person to help us to motivate us, to encourage us, to point out the impact that we're making on a Wednesday night when it looks sometimes chaotic. But you know what? God is at work. God is making an impact. If, and, and I know this student. And Susan, you'd know this student too. This, little, this, this student needs life spoken into her life to change the direction of the pattern that's set by her family. And it amazes me how God is able to reach in to some of the destructive patterns of families and pick one out. It's a great motivation for next fall when Susan stands here and says, hey, family night's getting ready to fire up again, right? And we need your help. And what, is that, and what does it entail? It's simply being available and speaking life and words of encouragement. So there in your outline, I have a couple of thoughts for you to help bring your speech under God's control that we can count our blessings by focusing in on the positive. We'll take away the anger and the bitterness from our spirit that leads us to make negative comments or accusations with each other. Get in touch with the love of God as we allow God to satisfy our spiritual needs and we'll have less of a need to strike out at others. Write our thoughts in a letter instead of lashing out. And that doesn't mean post it on Facebook. Okay? We can pour out our inner feelings and then not send the letter. Try it sometime. It's powerful. Instead, we should pray over that letter and ask God to give us a change of attitude and spirit. And then burn it. Or put it in the grinder or something. Try it. It's powerful. Wait before responding to a comment, criticism, or piece of gossip. And that does include emails, right? Take a moment. Don't respond so quickly. Take a moment. Make five positive comments to every negative one that we make about someone else. We love each other as we are, not as we should be. And to glorify God means to make the choice to share words of life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the roughness of James. Not only that he speaks into our life in a very practical and real way, but he gives us hope as he points us to the one. By God, by spending time with you, carving out of our schedules, which get filled so quickly with so many other great things, Lord, we have to set aside so that we can pick up your word and read it and ask your spirit to speak to us through it and apply it to our lives so that we can live out that life-giving hope. For Christ, you truly instill that in us as you have spoken again and again and again life into us. May we be refreshing streams and strong trees planted by water that yield its fruits in and out of season for your glory and for your honor. 
We celebrate this young person from family night and the impact that that's had in, in their life. And we know that just represents one. And it's so encouraging to see. Continue to strengthen us as a church. We thank you for the many, many volunteers that we have that give of their time and their effort and their energy that we may be a community of faith that makes an impact of love. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen.